Um, awesome. So hello, everyone. Welcome to iRes's fourth advice session, where we invite educators and also trainees to hold discussions surrounding the ophthalmology application process. My name is Chris Yang, and I am an MS2 at UC Irvine. And today, our session is going to be a residency panel with recently matched interns at different uh, programs in the US. So I'll let you guys introduce yourself first. Why don't we start with Jeffrey? Yeah. Hi, everyone. I'm Jeffrey. Um, I'm a MS4 at the University of Maryland, and I matched at Yale for residency. Hi, I'm Stacy. I'm a fourth year at University of Texas in San Antonio, and I matched at Vanderbilt for a residency. Hi, I'm Melody. I'm a MS4 at McGovern or UT Houston, and I matched at Baylor for residency. Awesome. So thanks, you guys, for being here. Um, and for all of the participants, I know you guys submitted, a few of you submitted questions you wanted to be asked during the session. So I kind of collated those and we'll go over those for the first half of the session. And then afterwards, uh, we'll leave it open for you guys to ask questions on your own. Okay. So first question that was shared among a lot of you guys, I guess we can kind of go in the same order if you guys don't mind. The yeah, panelists. That's fine. Okay. Uh, so how did you guys find your mentors when you first became interested in ophthalmology? And also, how did you get involved with research? Right. So for me, finding mentors, um, I guess once you kind of decide that ophthalmology is on your radar, you're interested in ophthalmology, I would just reach out first to your home program if you have one. Um, so just um, go to like your ophthalmology interest group or just ask around to see if um, people have like mentors that they know who've done research with students in the past and kind of email them, ask for a time to meet up. Um, and then once you meet with that mentor, you can discuss, hey, I'm interested in ophthalmology. I'm interested in learning more about that field and perhaps doing research uh, with you if you have any projects ongoing or making my own project. Um, so that first means you kind of establish that connection and your expectations um, of what you want from um, your mentorship relationship with, uh, with your mentor. And then after that, um, you kind of work on your projects. Um, you can go shadow your mentors. Like if you have like a free afternoon after like rotations or after lectures, uh, you can stop by the ophthalmology clinic and just ask if you can uh, spend the afternoon shadowing and seeing patients uh, with some of the ophthalmologists there. Um, so that's for people with like a home program. And then for people without home program, um, I would say reach out to local ophthalmologists in the area. If you have like a, um, a school nearby or, um, uh, local ophthalmologists like practice in the areas so kind of reach out to them or shout out them. Um, you, there's also lots of great mentors um, on social media like Twitter or uh, Instagram that will reach out to people uh, specifically without a home program. Um, so those are also resources to use. I think I kind of took um, almost the same route. I think I initially reached out to my home program. Um, we have a student, like director of student education in the ophthalmology department. So I reached out to her early on during MS1 year to kind of talk to her about, you know, what are some things that I need to be doing um, early on to get involved into ophthalmology and like what kind of research things I can be doing. So with her, I had a more of a, like a long-term relationship over four years. She was able to kind of help me with the application process as well. Um, and I also shadowed her a lot during MS1 and MS2 year just being in the OR and being in clinic with her she was able to um, teach me a lot how to use a slit lamp before I even did my rotation in ophthalmology um, and then aside from that I also did a research project with um, residents and faculty members in the ophthalmology department so I cold emailed um, a lot of faculty members and I was lucky enough to get onto a project and then from then on that relationship kind of led on to more research projects um, from that relationship and I think it's also very important to kind of have a relationship with uh, residents as well. So I hung out in the consult room a lot during MS1 and MS2 year whenever I had um, time because a lot of the residents were, you know, running around and even like going before them and like helping them dilate the eyes. Like I, it was helpful for them. So I built like relationship with them in that way. And a lot of residents have ongoing like, you know, case studies or uh, research studies going on. And it's a good way to get um, involved in the uh, department without having to be a little bit, um, I don't know. I, I was kind of like, daunted by faculty members initially I was like oh they're like faculty members but with residents I think it was a little bit easier to kind of ease into um, the department so I think it was a good way for me to get involved. I think I don't have too much more to add I think what I did was a lot of cold emailing and then also going residents MS4s they kind of have their finger on the pulse and they know across attendings who's doing what more than in emailing individual attendings 
being really persistent, I think it's just the takeaway. And that's how you got to med school is being very persistent about opportunities and being a go-getter. I think something to remember is it's a quality over quantity thing. If you have like one or two really great mentors who are willing to go to back for you, willing to add you to projects and keep you involved, that carries more weight and is far more helpful along the way than having a bunch of kind of surface level um, relationships. And I know this is kind of school specific, but ours in fourth year will give you a specialty specific advisor that you meet with throughout fourth year to help guide you in that sense. So research wise, you were kind of on your own and had to seek those opportunities out in some ways, but then they'll help you um, in fourth year later, later on. Awesome. I think those are awesome uh, pieces of advice that we could all uh, try to follow. Um, one add-on question for Jeffrey, you mentioned going to conferences and trying to network. Um, I think a recurring question among our participants is, how do you network at a conference? Like, what are some topics you can try to touch on when you're trying to introduce yourself to an attendee you might be interested in working with or just meeting? Right. So I think when going to conferences, it's very important to have a game plan, especially if it's your first one. Um, you come to the conference, you kind of look at the schedule, see who's there, if there's any uh, particular topics that you're really interested in. Um, let's say like there's someone that's doing research on AI or do research on like stem cells or um, like medical education, and you would kind of gravitate towards those pre uh, presenters and kind of see what their, their posters are about and try to talk to them there. Uh, and then once you meet those um, presenters that, uh, that interest you, uh, you kind of have prepared some good questions to ask, um, kind of ask them, because everyone loves talking about their own research and uh, what they're looking into. So just being, you know, genuinely interested, uh, trying to make a connection uh, there and, and then perhaps asking them if there's anything that you could help them out with. Um, or just just being interested in saying, um, let's say you're going to in a conference at, um, let's say for me it was last year at uh, Arvo's in Colorado. Uh, I actually was interested to see um, how the ophthalmology residency program was in Colorado. So I reached out to the, the program director there, who's very nice. Um, he said that I could come and shadow him uh, just for like a morning, and so that's um, I just reached out to him over email, and that's how I uh, set up that connection there. Uh, but mostly, I think. Uh, for conferences, it's a way to make connections, not just with uh, attendings, but with residents of different programs, but most importantly, with fellow medical students who are presenting with you. Uh, I met many of my close friends today, like Stacy, um, Chris, uh, Chris Cho uh, was there as, as well, um, and we're still friends today, and Stacy applied with me, and she's here today. So um, I think it's a great way to make friends that with people that are in the same position as you. Awesome. Okay. So next question uh, I have for you guys is, how did you prepare for your ophthalmology clerkship and also away rotations, if you did any? All right. So for ophthalmology clerkship, um, I think first thing is just to get a, um, a foundational base of the basics of, let's say, doing clinical exams, like a slit lamp exam, um, just know how um, just what's like the theory behind doing like the dilated fundus exam. Um, and then you do that by kind of looking, there are great online resources. There's a website called iGuru, uh, which provides, you know, basic level of information on like the, uh, on ophthalmology topics, ranging from basic skills to more advanced skills. Um, there's also a really good book that everyone recommends called OptoBook by Tim Root. Um, it breaks down everything really clearly, and it has links to YouTube videos that explain things very well um, for people that don't have any like exploit to ophthalmology at all. Uh, so those are great ways to start. And then once you have those basics down, you kind of sign up for, you know, if you have a home program, you sign up for your home program's ophthalmology elective. And usually that first elective, the expectations are really low. So I think you should take advantage of that by just trying to learn, just taking initiative for your own learning, trying to improve from whatever um, like core foundational skills that you have. Um, and everyone in that first rotation, they're very uh, understanding and actually uh, they're very happy to help you out and get those skills uh, down. Then after that first home uh, rotation, um, you will move on to doing away rotations if you're able to. Um, you apply on the VSLOW application system and try to do away rotations in programs that you're interested in. And then from there, you kind of build on the skills, making those connections with those programs there. Uh, and then to do well in those away rotations, I'll say the main thing is just trying to be, um, you know, a genuine, um, kind of quote unquote, normal person. You know, just, uh, don't be too overbearing or overeager. 
um, because sometimes that may come off the wrong way, but also don't just be like a fly in the wall and act uninterested um, because that's also noted. So I think there's a balance between um, trying to take initiative and not overstepping people's toes. Um, and usually, uh, as well in that way rotations, that's the main thing that they're looking for. And just in terms of building relationships, what kind of person you are, and then they'll move on to like, how are you as like a clinician or how are your skills in ophthalmology? Everyone has really low expectations. So I think the main thing is just be eager, be ready to learn, and then just show them that you're willing to improve yourself and learn more about the field. Yeah, I think um, he covered a lot of the things that I was um, thinking about. I think the only thing that I would probably add on is um, during like the first two years, whenever I was shadowing in the consult room or in clinic, um, it's a very low stakes like environment. You can make a lot of mistakes because, you know, they don't expect a lot from first year or second year medical students. Um, so even being able to do like basic eye exams or like pay, eye, take eye pressure um, was a good way to kind of get eased into doing basic eye exams. And um, whenever I did my actual rotation and away rotation, Something that really helped me was um, chart checking before. So if you have like clinic the next day, chart checking your clinic patients the night before. Sometimes they would have like 40 people on, like if it's like a retina day, there are like 40 people in clinic. So like I would kind of like skim through and see. Um, ophthalmology is a lot of like abbreviations and a lot of like the technical terms can be confusing at first. So if you don't want to be lost on your um, rotation, kind of looking up those terms early on the night before um, helped me kind of understand more the next day whenever the attending talked about teaching points I can ask questions because I looked it up already. Um, or if you have an OR the next day and there are like glaucoma uh, cases going on, some of the surgeries are really cool, but it's not like cataract surgeries. That's a, a little bit more like commonly seen. So for those surgeries, I would look up, you know, video, surgical videos before I kind of look up the steps for the surgery so that, you know, if, if there's like a complication or if there's um, time for questions at the end, you can ask those questions and they really um, are really impressed because they don't expect a lot. They're really impressed that, that um, you have those questions or that you looked them up before? I think the main things I want to highlight is just keeping it pretty basic. I remember feeling really overwhelmed and having this, I assumed that they expected me to be at this level, you know, as a resident, like operating at that level, which is just not the case. So having the introduction, just knowing the basics, focus on like the main core complaints that you would see in an opto clinic and having those down, I think is the most helpful thing. And then anything else beyond that is just an added benefit and you'll learn on your way. And I think one of the things that we try to do is practice on each other because we're at a huge disadvantage. You don't have a slit lamp at home. You probably don't have an indirect, all of these things. So if you have a time when there's nobody in clinic or maybe after hours, whatever it is for y'all to just go in and like feel and get a sense of how the slit lamp even works. So you're not like totally lost the first day. Um, because it, like everyone said, the expectation is not that high, but they like to see that some effort is made, made. You're not starting at entirely zero. Yeah, that's a really good point. I think I did that. I like the dilated um, exam with like each other. We were like dilated for hours, but we like yeah. practiced on each other and like helped me a lot. Cause like with patients, like you can practice with them, but you can only give it a few tries before they were like, oh, it's too bright. But with like students, we understand and we're like a little bit more patient with the brightness. And so it was a good way to practice our skills. Awesome. Those are those are awesome points. Thank you guys. Um, okay, so let's talk about the opto application. What do you guys feel like the biggest strengths of your applications, and also may have made you stand out on paper? Yeah. So for biggest strengths, I would say that um, for me, I had like a very clear kind of like theme or goal uh, and purpose on why I wanted to go into ophthalmology and. Uh, in my case, I was really interested in medical education and helping uh, out, you know, the next generation of medical students and people interested in ophthalmology um, through education and teaching and mentorship. So that was like a big uh, focus on my application and a lot of my uh, research was tailored towards that interest. So I think having a very clearly defined, you know, goal or interest that you have that you're passionate about and really show it through not um, just only your, your research, but also your extracurricular activities, um, as well as talking about it in your personal statement. Um, it kind of frames like a complete picture. Um, you know, all these programs are getting like over 600, 700 apps, and they only have a couple of seconds to go through your application. They want to read it in around, you know, a couple of minutes and say, all right, what is this person going to bring to our program? What's this person passionate about? And you have a very clear picture of what that is. And you can show it through your application just on paper. I think that will help you stand out. 
Yeah, I think that I think it's an advantage. Some people don't like it as much, but with the SF Match application, you have a lot more wiggle room and freedom to, you know, format your application a certain way. I think with ERAS, you know, they have um, certain like criteria, like certain sections where everyone everything has to be filled out, required sections. But with the ophthalmology um, SF Match application, it was literally like text box and then you can like fill out the text box and format it however much however um whichever way you would like and so it's a really good way to highlight like jeffrey said highlight the things that you really want to point out in your application you can bold it underline it you can you know bullet point it so that it's a little bit more noticeable like these people are skimming through these applications and so anything to kind of help them notice that there's a theme in your application i think was something that i was also trying to focus on um, a lot of, I think the theme of my application was more so, um, like, like Jeffrey said, like education, um, advising, like mentorship, and also like volunteering. So I really tried to highlight that in my application by putting them at the beginning of each section or underlining or bolding. Um, and that really helped me a lot, I think. Yeah, I think having a brand is pretty standard now. You pick like one or two things, and that's what you talk about in your application, in your interviews, in your application, just across the board. And that's how they can, they need something to remember you by and to like have something concise basically to take away from this very long application. And like I said, it's literally just a box. You can group things together in a certain way to highlight like, hey, I have a lot of mentorship. This is my thing. Um, but I think for my application, some of the, two of the things I think that help me stand out a little bit is having um, kind of all the subspecialties represent, not all, but most of the subspecialties represented in research. That's something that interviewers commented on. Um, and I think it shows that you have experience in all these different areas and you're making an effort to get these experiences. I think the other thing is your letters. Um, I haven't read my letters, but from what I can gather, they're pretty strong. And so to have people who know you really well and can speak very highly and um, ideally semi-well-known in the community, it's a small specialty. And so if you have somebody that is well-connected, then that goes a long way. I think they put a lot of trust in their colleagues. So if you have somebody vouch for you, I think it's super, super, super important. And I think that's something that definitely helped. Yeah. And something to add on. Um, so I, I also like kind of partake in our school, medical schools um, interview process. So I interviewed a lot of applicants into medical school. So having been on the other side as an interviewer, something that stood out to me was um, whenever people have hobbies or something personal on their application, it kind of gives me something to talk about during the interview. And definitely throughout my ophthalmology interviews too, I've talked about my hobbies so many times and it's it's cool to have like interesting hobbies to um, add on, add it on to your application so that you can talk about. Um, it kind of makes you more into like a person and not so much like you know just a paper or like just an application yeah Most really good point fewer, yeah go ahead Melanie yeah. Fewer, I was gonna say you get fewer behavioral questions if you have something interesting so I feel like knitting and I, that was my bit and I had this whole thing about it and so they they would rather talk to you about that than sometimes a lot they'll still ask you about research but that was kind of the trick that if you put like travel cooking exercise what everybody puts it's just hard to get anything from that yeah yeah, hobbies are the highest yield part of your app. Um, and then just like Melody said, don't just put cooking or something simple or like hiking. Say, what do you cook? I cook this specific cuisine or I'm the best, you know, pizza maker in the town. And it is, you got to put something interesting that sparks like conversation. Um, so I think it's really important to spend like a good deal of time on writing out your hobbies, actually. Great advice. Thanks, guys, for sharing. Um, so there are a lot of things that go into ophthalmology application, right? And, um, some of the participants are interested in knowing the relative importance of those things. I'm going to list out a couple of those things that people mentioned, some board scores, clerkship grades, research, letters of recommendation, their personal statement, and also extracurricular activities. What would you guys say are like the top three things you feel like are most important? All right, um, so I guess for me, uh, each of them will have different weight just depending on your background. But I think in a general sense, um, I think number one would be your layers of rec. Um, as Melody mentioned, it's, it's a really small field and they really trust their colleagues at um, words. Um, there are many times like during my interviews where uh, I've had people, uh, interviewers comment saying like, oh, I really trust um, one of your letter writer, writers uh, word because they they were actually my co-resident back then. Uh, so I had, just having that personal relationship um, really came uh, a big way. So I think one is letters of rec. Uh, two, um, 
I would say by now it might be research. I, I wouldn't say necessarily you need a lot of research, but you need to have at least one or two projects that you can talk um, very in depth about and you had a big part of. Um, so that um, so that's two would be research. Um, three, three could be a toss up. Um, it depends on what, you know, like I said, what kind of background you're coming from, what kind of school you're coming from. Um, but three would, I'll, I'll say be a combination of board scores and clerkship grades, just because you need to have like, uh, where, it's not like need, but then it's come to a point where there's kind of like a cutoff that most programs have um, in terms of like board scores, at least. Uh, now the step one is pass fail. I think it's really important to have a, um, a good enough step two score that wouldn't get you screened out by programs. And I'm not sure what the screen is gonna be. Um, because at least for our year, there are still people, uh, me included, that didn't submit their step two score. Um, so I don't know what the, the cutoff would be. Um, and in clerkship grades, uh, this is, um, it. I know it's important. I just don't know how important for clerkship grades. Uh, we've been asking some program directors, you know, on, on the IRS advice sessions uh, with like different responses. Um, because the clerkship grading for different schools is different. Some schools, you know, only have people honors for like the top 5%, while some schools have honors for top 20%. So how do you know like what uh, what the value of an honors on the rotation is? Um, so I think for clerkship grade, I think it's more important just to do as well as you can, try to get your really good evaluation in terms of the comments, because uh, sometimes the, um, the programs will look at the specific comments that people write about you on your rotations. Um, so I would focus on that. And then the last two would be uh, personal statement and extracurriculars. Uh, it's really dependent on the programs. I've heard some programs that say personal statement is one of the top three, uh, just because they read, uh, they really value like someone's story, someone's background. Why do I go to Alpha Much? While some programs are saying personal statement is like one of the lowest because they just read so much and they so many of them um, sound the same. And then extracurriculars, you know, everyone is going to be taking part in um, many of the same extracurriculars unless you have something that's super unique. Um, but if you do have something that's super unique, I would put it down for extracurriculars. It might be a good talking point, um, at least for the interview phase. So I don't really know how programs like filter out initially to get, you know, give out interviews. So I can only talk about from my side, um, having gone through the interview process, the things that that were brought up in my interview that I think were kind of um, highlights that kind of made me stand out. So um, like Jeffrey said, I think rec letter came up a lot during my interviews. They were spe specifically talking about actually one of my non-ophthalmology rec letters and they were really impressed by how in depth and how um, close I was with that rec letter writer and how impressed they were with me. So I think having a strong rec letter, not only in ophthalmology, but also outside of ophthalmology can be helpful as well. They obviously mentioned the ophthalmology letters as well, but um, I think, I I think I saw like a question like three ophthalmology questions versus like uh, ophthalmology rec letters versus like two and then one non-ophthalmology. Um, I think it depends, but having that perspective outside of an ophthalmology field and uh, having a letter um, outside of ophthalmology can be helpful in that way too. Um, and something else that was also brought up uh, was um, like gold humanism, AOA, um, or anything like volunteering that was brought up a lot during my interview process. I don't know if that was just because like the way my application was structured, but um, some programs do look at that a lot. They kind of want to make sure that, you know, on, on paper, you can be like a great person. You can have great board scores or clerkship grades, but they also want to make sure that you're you know, a good person that you're normal and you people like to be around you. So they kind of do look at those things too. And I think that's partially why the rec letters are so important too. Um, and I think lastly, like research, um, I, I also kind of um, was more like uh, quality over quantity. So I would say personally, out of like the ophthalmology applicants, I didn't have that many uh, research projects, but there were one or two projects that I could really talk about in depth, you know, starting with the IRB process and taking it to the manuscript writing and publishing process, being able to talk about your project in depth and saying that you took ownership and you were kind of a peer leader really was, um, I think, impressive to a lot of the interviewers. And so having that one or two projects that you can really talk about can be important. I think one of the things that surprised me most in this process and now looking, our class has a big Excel sheet and I'm sure a lot of schools do it that everybody who matched puts in their stats. And so now, you know, you see all your peers and where they kind of land. And so it is interesting. It's far more comprehensive and like cumulative than I thought 
because I think as a med student in my head, it was 60% step one and then, you know, 40% everything else. You just have this like really skewed understanding of what goes into it. But I think ophthalmology being so small, I think us having our own applications system, all of that lends itself to being very comprehensive. And so I have classmates who had higher board scores than me for step one and two, but I had a lot like double the interviews that she did. So I think it is, there is no one thing that matters. Obviously you want to put yourself in a position with, you know, as many honors as you can, you're competing with really competitive people across the nation. Everyone is very impressive, but I don't think there's many things that are super make or break. You can normally redeem yourself in a lot of ways. Um, and so I think letters of rec, like we've talked about really important. I think it's also too, we touched on this, like grades are hard to compare across institutions. Everyone does something differently. Some schools don't even have clinical grades. Um, so I think that adds a curveball, but I think just trying to be well-rounded in a quality type of way, instead of just going through and trying to check all these boxes, like, okay, I need as many pubs as possible when some of it's kind of fluff and they know that, and they can clock that from a mile away. So if you have genuine passions and genuine things that you're interested in ophthalmology or otherwise, I think that's really helpful. And you would be surprised. They like to see that you, you can be good at ophthalmology and you having a strong opto letter is great, but like. Like Stacey said, if you can do well and show interest and impress people in other fields, I think that carries a lot of weight too. Like, yeah, we know she's going to try and the one thing she wants to do, but does she try on her neuro rotation? Does she try on family med, all of those things? So it really is comprehensive. And I think having a couple areas where you stand out is sufficient. You don't have to excel. You don't have to cure cancer to go to med school. You don't have to like discover something new in ophthalmology to match. So I think it's kind of helpful to have that perspective. Awesome. So what I'm hearing is letters of rec and also just being overall well-rounded, well like normal person with hobbies. Great. Okay. So I'm going to ask one last question to you guys. Um, how did you prepare for your interviews? And after your interviews, did you send any letters of interest or intent? Do you have any thoughts on if, if you did, do you have any thoughts on if those are helpful? All right. So first starting with interviews, um, personally for me, what I did was I went to the ophthalmology Google spreadsheet um, that everyone pretty much knows about. But on that spreadsheet, uh, people have posted interview questions from the previous cycle. And uh, for our year, we also did the same for this cycle. And I went and copy and pasted all those questions, put them on a Word doc, and then just went through all the questions and just jotted down bullet points, um, just like talking points that I would say if I were to get asked those questions on my actual interview. And I would say around up to like 70% of the time, I, like I would be asked some variation of those questions. Um, so that's how I kind of uh, practiced interviewing. I also uh, scheduled many mock interviews with my friends, my mentors. Um, they would just hop on Zoom and they would just, uh, first we would check, you know, since it's virtual interviews now, I'm not sure when or if they will go back to in-person, um, but since it's virtual now, making sure that your audio is good, making sure that, um, video is good, lighting is great, background is okay. Um, if you're, are you looking at the camera when you're talking, um, those things are great to practice before the actual interview. Um, so I, that's like getting started with the interview. Also preparing for behavioral question because some uh, programs really like um, asking, you know, tell me about a time when you had a conflict or tell me about a time when you um, really went out of your way for a patient or was a team player. Um, having specific examples that are really good that you can talk in depth about is really important. You can even use the same example for multiple cases or scenarios that they ask. Uh, so that can help with interview preparation as well. And then I guess for uh, letters of interest, last intent. So letters of intent means, should mean that you're ranking that program number one, no matter what. And that is only sent to one program, preferably by like closer to the end of interview season so that it's it's genuine um, because it's a really bad look. Um, if you send a letter of intent, say you're breaking a program number one, and then when it comes down to it, you don't actually rank the number one. Uh, so make sure when you send a letter of intent, send it to one program. Uh, and I did send that to my uh, number one program um, and it, it did help because um, that's where I match. Um, and then for letters of interest, uh, I would say letters of interest might not be as helpful uh, I'm talking to some program directors that said they read the letter of interest and they're like, oh, nice, you're interested in us. I know, could you apply to our program? And then they throw your letter of interest away. Uh, while other programs um, might be like, oh, um, 
maybe if you have like a personal connection to the letters of uh, the program I just said the letters of interest for, like maybe that's your hometown, or maybe if you have uh, some significant other there or other family there, uh, those are real substantial um, thing or reasons for sending a letter of interest to a program. And then in that case, some programs might give you a second look and then might interview you after that. Um, so I would say for those are for letters of interest. And I, I sent um, a couple of letters of interest. I would say keep it to probably less than four or five. Uh, you don't want to send out too much either because programs talk. And then if you send out to half the program list that you apply to, um, then it defeats the value. And people may just talk about it and say, oh, this person is not genuine. This person is just sending letters of interest to everyone. Uh, so that's also something to keep in mind. So for me, preparing for interviews kind of broke down into two parts. So the first part is obviously like preparing to answer the questions that the interviewer might um, might ask. But I also kind of looked at it on the perspective that, you know, if I'm interviewing there, that may be the program that I might match at. So I really looked at the information that they provided on their website, like what is their clinical like style like, um, what's their like location like, what kind of rotations do they offer, and then like what kind of research projects they have going on. So really like make, I made like a Word document for each program with like the same standard questions, like what's the call schedule, what's like the different clinical sites, and like answered all of those questions um, before I had the interview. So that whenever I did get a chance on interview day to talk with residents or faculty members, if they ask me, do you have any questions for me? Um, if there were any parts of that Word document that were left blank because it wasn't on their web page or something like that, I would ask those questions so that I would be well informed when I'm making my ranked list. Um, so I think that's very important on your part as well, because you're making a decision as well, you know, making your ranked list. So I think it's important to know what each program has to offer and what their strengths are. And then on the other part, I kind of did took the same process preparing for the interview questions. Um, I think a lot of, for me at least, a lot of the interviews did not ask specifically like, why do you want to come to our program? Which was kind of like funny because I got that question a lot during my med school application. And so I was kind of preparing for that. Um, but I didn't really get that question a lot, but um, they did ask about, you know, what are you looking for in a program? And that's your opportunity to say, these are the things I'm looking for. And those things can align with what the program has to offer, which kind of implies that you want to go to that program. So depending on the question that you get, you can kind of like twist it so that you can show more interest to the program. Like you offer research. I want to go to a program that has strong research program that kind of says that like, hey, I want to go to your program. Um, and then a lot of the questions that I got were like, have you been to blank? like this city that where uh, the program is located in um so kind of like looking up the city a little bit more before like oh no i haven't been but i heard it's like you know the biggest city in this area or i heard like this is like a cool thing in that city and i'm interested to go check it out it kind of shows them that you're like interested in actually coming to that program too so i think kind of looking up more about the city itself the program itself before the interview kind of led me to be able to talk more about the fun things um at the program about the program on interview day um, and as for a letter of interest or a letter of intent, I didn't send anything after the interview, but I did send letters um, before interview. So um, with the interview offers, they get kind of like sent out, like trickle out um, after like the first day where a good chunk of the interview offers get sent out, they trickle out some of the programs. And if I see, there's a spreadsheet where people kind of share like, hey, I got an interview at this program. So you know which program sent out interviews on which day. Um, so after like checking that spreadsheet, if there's a program that I'm really interested in, but I didn't get an interview offer, I would reach out to that program after and be like, hey, I'm like interested in coming to or interviewing at your program and here are the reasons. And so that's when I sent the letter of interest. And by doing that, I got like two additional um, interviews at the programs that I was interested in. So I think that was a good time for me to kind of reach out to those programs, but I didn't reach out after um, I interviewed with the programs. Okay, I have wrote down a list of things I wanted to talk about really quick. So for interview, I think one thing I didn't expect that ended up being really helpful is scheduling. It's a little bit hard because you apply to a lot of schools. And so you can't plan for every combination of events. You don't know who's going to interview you, but I had an Excel sheet with like a what looks like a calendar. And so each day I would put all the schools that offered because a lot of them overlap. We're fortunate in that it's a very short interview time frame, but that means you have like two a days, a lot of the days. And so you don't want to be in a position that you're declining interviews purely for scheduling. I would, it's really upsetting. It's something that hopefully we can try and avoid. And I was able to avoid that for the most part. But when you get the interview invite, it's a mad dash sprint and you want to sign up. You're like watching it go down as you like sign onto the page, not to freak everybody out, but you want to be quick and you want to have a plan and be prepared. So when you get that interview, you say, okay, this is the date. I have an interview this day and you can schedule it and then you're done. So I think that's extremely helpful. 
Um, we talked about like background is so important, things like that. Having a backup plan if and when there's construction, the power goes out, whatever it may be, keeping that in mind. Sometimes like our school had rooms you could rent um, and reserve for that. Um, other things I think to know it's a marathon, not a sprint. It's a lot and it's really exhausting and it's so easy to phone it in at the end. Um, and it's hard because sometimes some of the more, like for me, my top school like Baylor was my first choice and I interviewed there last. So to really like keep up the fight at the end was hard, but you really, you work so hard to get to this point. You don't want this like two hour interview to be what stands in your way. Um, so I think that's really important to remember. Um, another thing is anything on your application is fair game any case report, anything with your name on it, you might be eighth author, but if it's on there, they're allowed to ask you about it. And I didn't get too many content questions. A lot of them were wanted to hear what mattered most to me, which one I enjoyed the most, but it's on there and it's fair game. And it happened a couple of times. So I think that's something to keep in mind. And um, there's a list on iGuru. It is very extensive with a lot of questions. Some of them are a little silly. You might still get asked. I got asked to tell a joke. So whatever, just have something in your back pocket just in case. Um, so that's helpful. And then also thinking about writing a list of all your experiences and kind of having a story bank so that if, and when they ask you a question that you weren't prepared for or is a little bit different than what you had prepared, you can pull from this set of stories that are really versatile and can have a bunch of different lessons and can be applied in different circumstances. So I think that's helpful too. Um, other things, Stacey talked about the city. I was going to say too, if there's people from your school that have matched there in the past couple of years, I would reach out just even if nothing else, just to say that you did. I think it shows a lot of interest when they say, oh, do you know blah, blah, blah that matched here last year or the year before? And for you to say, yes, I reached out to them. They spoke very highly of the program is just another thing that helps and helps solidify that connection. You have the connection you have with the program. And then I'm like rambling, but I didn't send letters of interest, but I think one thing, in addition to maybe you sending an, an email, you can have a mentor reach out. I had a mentor offer. Um, I just didn't take them up on it, but I think that's really helpful too. And again, they, they trust colleagues a lot. And so to have them do it, I think is very helpful. I did send a letter of intent to Baylor. Um, like we said, if you want to send it as early, um, after interviews, after you finish all of them so that it's legit. Um, but you want to be sure, because I think the cost benefit of that is kind of high. So if you know, like, this is where you want to be, then great, send it. But if you're not sure, and you think you might change your mind, I don't think the benefit of that is worth the stress and all the anxiety that comes from putting, sending the letter and then being like, wait a minute, I'm going to change after open houses or whatever it may be. So that's something to keep in mind. Open houses ha occur after they submit their list. So there's no like takes these backsies on that. So I just think if you know, great, send it. If not, it's just not worth um, the stress that I think it can, can bring up. But those are my thoughts. Awesome. Thanks guys for your, for your thoughts. I like picked up a lot of tidbits that I don't really learn about at this stage of med school. Um, cool. So those are the, the prepared questions I had for you guys. I think now we can open the floor to the audience. Anyone can feel free to, you know, drop their questions in the chat or unmute themselves. Do you have any directed questions? If not, I can ask them. I had a quick question about um, away rotations. So first of all, thank you all for like talking to us about this. This is something that I feel like a lot of us get bits and pieces of here and there, but having a, an organized way to just disseminate this knowledge is super helpful for future applicants. So thank you. Um, and so, yeah, my question was, let's say I have a program that I'm very interested in. Um, and I've been told it's important to apply to a couple different away programs because you might not get the one that you want necessarily. Um, but let's say like program one uh, date of like, the date they start opening up applications comes before program two's date of opening up applications, but program two is the one that you actually super want to go to. Um, and then let's say in some chance of events, you get program one, uh, like an acceptance of program one. How would you like kind of figure that out? Uh, I know it looks bad to like decline an offer um, in anticipation of like program two accepting you or denying you or 
program two still hasn't reached a conclusion. Does that question make sense? I know it's a little confusing, but. Yeah, um, so in that case where, you know, if you actually have the acceptance for program one and it's in the same time frame that you applied for program two, like, so let's say you applied for an August away rotation and that's the only time that you are able to do an away rotation. And you have to either choose between program one or potential program two, and you have program one's acceptance. Uh, in this case, you have to make a choice. You have to know that if you decline program, or and this is just what I heard from my mentor. So if anyone has something different, feel free to add. Um, my mentors told me that if I decline program one's acceptance, there's a high likelihood that program one will not um, interview me because you know you applied there, you got the acceptance, and and then you kind of decline. Um, however, there's other there. It depends on the program as well. I heard some programs where it's like the away rotation process is not even related to the interview selection process. So they wouldn't even know who they accepted or declined. Um, but there's no way to tell which programs are which um, unless you actually have someone in the, the inside knowledge or part of the selection process. Uh, so I think every in that case, you just had to run the risk of not getting the interview to program A. And if you're okay with that, then absolutely you can decline and try to wait out for program B. And to increase your chances of getting away at program B, I would reach out to them and say, oh, I'm like throughout the whole application, the process for away, say, I'm, I'm still really interested in your, um, in hearing back from my application. I hope um, this is, these are some reasons, like kind of like a mini letter of interest of why you want to do an away rotation at that program uh, might help. Yeah, I think um, I had a very similar like thought process. So I had a very, like, I wanted, Vanderbilt was my number one program. And so I wanted to do an away rotation there. Ironically, I didn't get the away rotation. So I kind of understand what you're like talking about. I have a very specific region. I had a very specific region I wanted to go to. And so um, when I didn't get the away at Vanderbilt, I was kind of thinking, you know, at the initial thought process was there were programs around that area that I wanted to do aways at as well. But the Vanderbilt application opened after um, those other programs opened their applications. So I was kind of thinking the same thought process, like what if I apply to these other uh, programs, um, but it turns out that I also get accepted into Vanderbilt later, I'm going to have to give up the, the, the first programs that I applied to. Um, I think whenever I made the decision, I was kind of thinking like, um, because I have a very specific region I want to go to, that's something that I am sort of willing to take the risk on. Um, because if I don't get the away or if I don't get the interview or whatever, like there's zero chance of me matching there. But if I at least get accepted into an away or um, even if I have to decline, maybe like during the interview process, maybe I can like reach out to them and email, be like, hey, this happened during my away rotation application, but I'm really interested in getting an interview. Like there are ways that you can reach out to the program afterwards and kind of, I guess, try to fix it. Um, but I, I've heard that thing too, where if you kind of decline the away rotation, the chance of you getting an interview might go down a little bit. So um, that's something that you kind of have to decide on, like, is that a risk that you're willing to take or it's, it's a cost benefit thing that you really do have to think about? Yeah. Oh, sorry. I was just gonna add one more thing. Um, I think it also something to keep in mind that was kind of surprising to me. I had heard that doing in a way does not guarantee an interview. And in my head, I presume this was like top five, top 10 programs, but it's kind of across the board and it's hard to predict. So that being said, you doing in a way does not equal an interview necessarily. Sometimes it works out, sometimes it doesn't. So that's, I think an important thing to, to keep in mind. Also, if it's between you doing in a way at maybe a school that's not number one on your list, but doing in a way versus you know, holding out and seeing if you get one and then not doing it away at all. Like which scenario is more appealing to you? Which one do you think would benefit you the most? Um, and then go from there. It's not an easy decision. I was struggling with the whole thing. Everything feels very make or break at this stage. So I totally understand that. I had a similar thing. I guess I wasn't accepted yet. They were still thinking about it and uh, reviewing applications for Baylor and I declined it and went and did it in a way somewhere else. So of course I, you know, spiraled from that, but it works out in the end and just kind of reflect on what what's most important to you and what you think will be most beneficial in that in that time frame. Thank you so much. That that is actually very helpful in contextualizing things. Okay, I have a question. Um, so 
Do you guys have any advice for applying to aways or residency programs that are geographically far away from you? Like for instance, I am on the West Coast, but I know I want to be on the East Coast for residency. So how'd you go about approaching that um, as you enter fourth year? Yeah, if you really want to be on the East Coast, I would recommend doing at least one of your aways on the East Coast. And depending on which state or which region of the East Coast you want, I would do the away in that region. And then pre preferably in a program that you would be really happy with um, after like looking through, you know, the programs um, that for, for those aways. Uh, I guess when you apply, it might be hard um, without stating like a direct connection. So if the away, some away applications say that you have to give them a letter of rec or give them a personal statement. So perhaps letting your letters or letter writers know of the reasons specifically of why you want to go to the East Coast, whether that be for family, for significant others, um, or just like interests, you know, in that region over there, your hometown. Uh, I'll put that in those letters or put that in your personal statement. Um, so I think that's how I would approach it at first. Yeah, um, I did something like a mini letter of interest that like Jeffrey talked about, whatever I did, my like away rotation application. Sometimes the programs, like like Melody said, like not get, doing an away at a program doesn't guarantee an interview, but a lot of the interviews may come from their away students. And so whenever the programs look at their away applications, they're kind of looking at like, oh, are these people potentially going to interview with us slash match with us? So um, kind of letting them know that you're really interested in a program and not just like applying across the nation. Um, so what I did was like, I sent like a mini and a letter of interest to the away programs that I was interested in. Like, here are the reasons that I want to rotate with you. And I had like a specific geographical reason. So like, they wouldn't be able to tell that from my away application. So I included that in, in the email and so when they saw that they were kind of thinking like oh she's actually willing to do an away here and maybe even potentially match here um so i think that helped me a lot in getting that away rotation cool thanks for sharing that definitely helps me internalize things too um it looks like there's a question in the chat um two questions so after the first one is after going through this process, is there anything you would change or do differently? And the second one is, did you dual apply? And what are your thoughts on that? All right, so first question, um, anything I would change? Uh, I said, I, I guess for me, I kind of wish I prepared for interviews longer. Um, I had a limited time frame because I would, I, wanted to get my step two over with, even though I wasn't submitting, uh, I still had to like study a little bit uh, enough to pass at least. Um, so I was kind of constrained on like interviews. So I like, I took my step two and I jumped right into interviews like next couple of weeks or something. Uh, so leaving more time for interviews and then not under rating like the amount of preparation that's needed for interviews um, is, is important. So that's something that I would change. Um, and then two, did you uh, dual apply? Uh, I did not dual apply, but I do have friends that did. Um, uh, dual applying, I think it's going to depend a lot on, you know, your own background and what are your own goals, what are you going to be satisfied and happy with, and then kind of what does your mentor, what do your mentors and home program, if you have one, uh, recommend. Uh, so I think a lot of things for dual applying is, first of all, what are the reasons that you're dual applying? Um, are you dual applying because you just want to have the ease of mind that even if you don't match off the line, you have you know, a back of specialty. And that's a completely valid reason. I had friends um, that, that do apply, even though they're very competitive applicants, still do apply just to have, you know, that safety net and not have the anxiety of not matching. Um, or are you do applying because one of your uh, components of your application is deficient, where that be uh, board scores, uh, where that be not enough uh, research, um, or like maybe like a, perhaps like a red flag in your application that you just want to um, address and just have something back up. Um, so you can also do apply for um, for that. And then when you do do apply, just make sure um, that you have you know enough interest in that field. Are you gonna be still gonna be happy enough? What would you rather be happy matching to your back especially? Or would you do you think you would always like have in the back of mind, oh maybe I should have just reapplied again and tried to match ophthalmology? Because there it, there are alternatives to dual applying, um, perhaps perhaps taking a um, a research year or a pre-residency research fellowship 
Uh, if you don't match the first time, that's an option that I see many people do. Uh, many people do. Um, so I think just exploring all the different options that you can have, other than uh, it, other than dual applying, and if you don't match to ophthalmology. Uh, so those are my thoughts. So I'll kind of answer the second part of the question first. So with regards to dual applying, I didn't. I don't think this is technically dual applying, but I did apply to prelim years specifically. So prelim year is your intern year, and sometimes programs have like joint programs or integrated programs, or sometimes um, I think right now by this time um, all the programs are pretty much joint or integrated. But I've heard stories of people who just did like their prelim prelim year at one program, and then a second year position opened up, a second PGY two position opened up at another program, and so they were kind of able to go in at the PGY two because they completed completed it. In year. Um, so with that thought, it's very rare, but I was kind of thinking like, if I don't match it to ophthalmology, like what do I want to be doing next year? And I was kind of thinking like, do I want to do research? Not really. I'd rather get like clinical experience. And so I applied to prelim year, which is like the intern year, um, thinking that I would be able to get that experience. Even if I have to repeat intern year after I like reapplied ophthalmology and like match somewhere else, even if I repeat intern year, like that was an experience that I was willing to um, gain. And so I applied to prelim years and those programs knew that I was also applying to ophthalmology. I think with um, dual applying, a lot of the times it's kind of like you keep it down low. You don't let programs know that you're dual applying um, just because it kind of, it can look like you're not really committed to the, the specialty. Um, but for me, for the prelim um, program, I let them know that I was also applying ophthalmology. I don't know if that was a good idea, to be honest, because I didn't get any prelim interviews. And I think that's partially because they were like, oh, she's applied to ophthalmology. She's like not really interested in prelim year. Um, but it was like a good backup plan. Um, that I had at the time, I thought it was a good idea um, to have that backup plan. So that's another option that you can do. Um, and with regards to like going through the process and like um, if there's anything I would like to change, we mentioned this several times, but something that I didn't do. And so I'm like thinking back if I did it, I think it would have been more helpful. It's like, even if you have to kind of like, even if you don't have like connections with residents at the program, or if you don't know anybody at the program, um, I think there are ways where you can find like, you know, residents and their contact information, like their email or something at the program. If there's a program that you're really interested in, but really don't have any idea, like specifically what their lifestyle is like or what the city is like, just kind of reaching out to those people at the program or the city and seeing what it is like to be at the program gives me a better idea because there are some programs that like I loved on my interview day but like realistically I wasn't sure like how much of it was just because from you know one day you can't really see everything about the program so having an insider information about the program from a resident or someone who's at um who's been there I think is very important to have and so something I wish I would have done is to reach out to the people at the program It's so funny you applied to prelims because I had like gone back and forth about it a million times. We all talked about it extensively. Like what's the right answer here? I think a lot of people have different ways that they kind of strategize and have backup plans in place. I had very, very briefly thought about dual applying. I don't even think I knew what I would do apply, but I just like had that idea in my head. So, but I think if you genuinely have something that you think you would be happy with, then that's something to consider. And like we said, kind of keep it on the DL. I've heard anecdotally that they can find out somehow whether or not that's true is kind of a separate thing. Um, but for me, I was kind of opto from day one. This is really the only thing I wanted to do. And so I didn't dual apply and just kind of hope for the best. Um, I did, I think I had one classmate who dual applied. So not very few of us did um, from my classmates this year. Um, as far as things I would change, I would, this is kind of a hot take. I would apply to fewer programs. I really went overboard and I applied to a lot. I'm from Texas. I've been here my entire life. So I don't know why I thought like some of these states would take me. I have literally no ties to the area. So I probably could have reined it in a little bit um, in that sense. And looking at historically, like what, where people from your school have matched, I think is helpful. It's not make or break. There's always somebody trailblazing in a different institution. But if, you know, they've only taken Ivy League institution people and you are not from an Ivy, then like, yeah, you could shoot your shot or maybe not. So that was kind of the thing I went back in and trimmed it down. Um, so I applied to a lot of programs and I probably could have um, done, done less in that sense. And also something I did do that I think is helpful is just being not strategic, but like in, in fourth year, you have required rotations. And so some of the schools will limit the number of absences you have, obviously. And when you're interviewing, it's a lot of days. So if there's a way to not have a required rotation in those two months, and maybe you're like me now who's doing required rotations, it's helpful Then you're not trying to like coordinate with them. This is one more thing you're worrying about having to make up all these days and so setting yourself up for success in that way. So the only thing you're doing is interviewing and that's 
what you're focused on, I think is really helpful. Um, those are kind of my main main points. Awesome. I think we have time for one more question. There's one more in the chat about ways. Um, how many ways did each of you guys do? And how many do most applicants do on average, if you know? All right. So yeah, I would say, oh, I did two aways. And then most people in my class did two to three aways. And I think that's kind of like the standard for standard advice for most schools. And I say this is most schools because sometimes you have different circumstances or coming from a school without a home program or you're coming from uh, a school that's a DO program. And in that case, you have to do more ways um, is the advice that I've uh, seen. Uh, people without home programs, uh, of course, are in a less advantageous state. So if you're in that position where you don't have a home program, I would recommend um, doing more, depending on, of course, your own capabilities, your own financial you know, resources, because the ways are very expensive. Um, so in that case where you don't have a home program, doing more ways will actually be more beneficial to you. Um, but if you do uh, and are fortunate to have a home program, I would say do your home programs away or elective and then do two to three aways. So I did one away, I think was on the side of like less fewer um, aways. I think a lot of my friends who applied this year did like two or three. Um, and it was an interesting case for me because I did my away after I submitted my, I submitted my application. So a lot of people do their aways before they submit their application just so they can, you know, talk about it on their application or um, kind of signal that you're interested in a region. But for me, I was more so on, I want to check out what the program is like. Um, I want to see what the city is like. So yes, it was helpful because it was still during interview season. So I guess I could like add it onto the application and like send them like, oh, I updated my application. Make sure like send those emails to programs that I updated my application. But I used it more as a guide for me to get to know more about programs and see how different structures or different teachings are like at other programs too. So I, I was on the unique side. So I only did one like V slow away um, where I applied and did it through that. And I did it after interviews. I didn't need or after applications were submitted. Um, so I didn't need a letter from them. Obviously, if you wanted a letter, then that would change your timeline. But then I did two, um, I did like a research rotation. So it's kind of unofficial, not through V slow for a month. And then I did one with a private practice here in Houston. Um, and so three kind of, but one like official through V slow. Great. Okay. Thank you guys for your input. And I think in the interest of time, I will probably end this session here. But thank you, Jeffrey, Stacey, and Melody for your time and also sharing your knowledge. Um, we appreciate it. And I wanted to make a, a plug for IRES. Um, we will be transitioning the board later this spring. So keep an eye out on Twitter for board applications if you're interested in applying. And yes, everyone has dropped their 